Hello, and a uh, good, uh, slightly, almost closely past afternoon. Um, it's, it's, uh, I'm between you and your lunch break, uh, but I think because you're here, um, you're excited about Hypervisor Framework just as much as me. Um, so really quick, um, who, who am I? What are we talking about? Um, I'm, I'm Alex Graf. Uh, I work at uh, Amazon, uh, mostly on KVM-related things, but this is not KVM. I'm going to have a look quickly at what this, how this compares to KVM, but uh, here we're looking at macOS technology. Um, all opinions are my own. Uh, this is not uh, official company uh, work. So on macOS, if you want to virtualize um, a system, if you want to spawn a virtual machine, uh, traditionally, as a user, you just see, hey, I'm, I'm running my hypervisor and things just work, right? But underneath the hood, um, what that meant is uh, that your virtual machine monitor, like the thing that, that actually shows you the display and such, that one needed to go and uh, leverage CPU instructions that are privileged, which means it had to have code running inside of the macOS kernel. Now, I don't know if you're familiar with code quality of hypervisors, um, but let's just say that KVM is uh, probably leading the bunch there. <clears throat> Which means um, Apple was very uh, enthusiastic about uh, getting these people out of the cut because they just kept getting bug reports um, about things that really were not related to their code at all. And they were thinking hard on how to actually get there, um, which uh, eventually led them to the development of something called hypervisor.framework. So hypervisor framework is a combination of two things. It's um, piece in the, a piece, piece of code in the kernel, in the macOS kernel, that uh, is able to, on Intel, drive VMX, on ARM, basically drive all of the uh, EL2 uh, extensions to, uh, to, to spawn a virtual machine, and a user space component, a library, uh, that gives you a simple interface into the actual uh, kernel uh, ABI. And what that allows them to do is, um, because they now move the actual hypervisor code into user space, what that allows them to do is, they can lock down their kernel. And that's exactly what you're seeing on these Apple Silicon Macs, um, where uh, you are no longer allowed to run, uh, to, to inject even your own uh, code into the Apple kernel. So uh, just some background on why exactly that, that whole framework exists. I'm not saying we should follow the same path with Linux. I really don't want to have something that is completely locked down. But this is why they did it. What ended up happening is um, they built something that actually allows us, or as, as QMU, for example, uh, to go and reuse the exact same framework to then do virtualization ourselves. So now um, we as an, as an open source community can actually use this framework that they built to solve a purely commercial problem for them um, as a lever uh, to, to uh, use virtualization. And if you look at this picture, this kind of looks almost like KVM, doesn't it? Like if you would draw a picture of how KVM communicates to things, it's like, yeah, you have like a layer in between your hardware and your user space that happens to live in the kernel. It's the same, right? Well, yes and no. Um, let's take a quick look at, uh, at that actual API. Uh, the hypervisor framework API for ARM, this is the ASCC4 version, is super minimal. I don't know if you've ever looked at the KVM API and it's uh, hundreds of API calls that you can do and uh, it's plethora of features that it has but hypervisor framework is simplistic like nothing. It basically just says, hey, you can create a VM context, you can create CPUs, you can destroy them, and you can set a couple of registers. That's it. So if you want to put this in pictures, um, you would basically say, hey, you have a hypervisor framework, and using this, I can create a VM container, same as KVM. In that VM container, I can go and map memory between my process, that my VMM process, and, and the virtual machine, same as KVM. I can create vCPU containers that then contain vCPU state, same as KVM. But now comes the big difference. So when you go and start to execute that virtual machine, when you go and say, hey, I'm, I have a virtual, virtual CPU, go and run, go into this context there and run this, same as KVM, by the way. Um, the return values are vastly different. What happens is um, KVM always interprets everything on behalf of you in the kernel and does a lot of work for you. Hypervisor Framework is trying insanely hard to do as little as it can in the kernel. Anything that's policy, anything that's, um, that's any logic that would not uh, uh, 
break secu the security model of the, of the macOS kernel is move to user space. And that means what you get as exit uh, variant, as, as, uh, as, as exit return value from this uh, CPU run execution is literally the same thing that your hardware delivers into the real uh, EL2 call. So you no longer have two different documents. You don't have a, an architecture definition uh, like we do on, um, on, 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 on KVM where you have an architecture definition and the architecture does things and then you have another completely different ABI uh, that describes how KVM actually operates and does things. You just have one. It's just the architecture definition tells you exactly the encoding for every single uh, event return that there is. The same thing, like the only thing missing now to, to create a functional virtual machine is interrupts. And that one is trivial again as well, because in a, in a super core, simplistic, um, deep down world, what you, what you have on ARM is just two interrupt lines. You have an, uh, an IIQ line and an FIQ line. That's it. Nothing else. So what you can do as, uh, uh, in, in hypervisor framework is literally just basically set each of them as active. <clears throat> Which again is very different from KVM in case you know that uh, ABI for ARM. So let's take a look at what happens if you want to go and, um, and actually run Linux. Uh, let's say you want to go and do qmu-kernel and directly straight boot a Linux kernel uh, into the system. So you take your Linux image, you load it into the virtual machine. You create this virtual machine context with RAM and with CPU state. You load that image all the way straight in. And now your register state contains your Linux uh, registers, your um, RAM contains the image. And all you need to do now is basically say, go and run the CPU, please. And then it does that. And the first thing that you see is, hey, I got an HVC exit. Why did you get an HVC exit? Well, very simple. Um, you ask Hypervisor Framework again, hey, can you just give me the reason why this HVC exit happened, which HVC exits typically are um, SMCCC calls, which is a specific, specific uh, calling convention in, in ARM, which in X0 contain the reason why you called it. Uh, so you just ask it, can you give me the value for X0? It returns the value for X0. You know, oh, this is a PSCI call. Again, ARM thing. Uh, and so you just return success. Well, you, ideally, you also do some work. But um, well, from a hypervisor framework point of view, all you would then need to do is um, set registers again and keep going. You just go and run your vCPU again. And you do that a couple of times uh, and also handle a few things like page faults. And suddenly you have Linux running. Easy, isn't it? Anyone could write a hypervisor. Uh, so uh, as you can see down there in the, in the statistic, um, to get to that screen, which uh, means you have a full Linux kernel um, booted up to the point where I just couldn't find it with its root device, uh, we had a whole hopping total of uh, six HVC calls, which are PSCI calls, just to probe the system and, and uh, look if there's another CPU. Uh, we had um, two system registers we had to uh, tackle. I don't remember which ones. Uh, and all of the rest, like the other almost 30K, uh, that's MMIO calls. So uh, calls to the interrupt controller, calls to the serial port, uh, calls to enumerate your PCI Express, and so on. All of these data boards would be, or not all of them, but almost all of these data boards would be also available, or would, would, you would also have to handle in KVM. Okay, so um, if, you, if you look at what uh, Hypervisor Framework does, is it really just handles the bare minimum that is security relevant for, um, for, for exiting, uh, for, for handling virtual machines. It handles the MMU, because you don't want to leave your memory management um, to user space, right? So it handles the actual MU generation where it creates page tables so that your virtual machine uh, only has access to its own memory. Uh, it handles the world switch where you switch registers between the two worlds. Uh, it handles a few system registers that are relevant. Not every system register actually contains sensitive information. Things like uh, ID registers, um, what number of CPU am I, what, uh, what CPU features do I have available? All of these are important to create a virtual machine that is um, consistent and works, but it's not important from a security point of view. So they move all of that to user space. Um, they don't handle that in kernel. Uh, and vTimer support. vTimer is important because uh, the vTimer is a, an integral part of the CPU core. So um, that one needs to be configured by, by the kernel. And the whole rest of everything that virtualization uh, entitles 
is in user space. So you have uh, your typical device simulation VM layout, same as KVM, right, um, in, in user space. But you also implement your interrupt controller in user space. You implement the PMU in user space. You implement most of the remaining system register traps in user space, like um, functionality probing. You implement PSCI in user space. And you basically implement anything you didn't know in user space. So is there an access to some system register? Is there a hypercall that I didn't know? Is there anything else I didn't know? It just immediately goes to user space. Now let's compare that to KVM, right? If you look at KVM, KVM in kernel space handles everything, <laughs> basically. So KVM in kernel space goes and, uh, and handles the world switch, the MMU, the system registers, and the VTime. I like hypervisor framework, but on top of that, it also handles all the other pieces that are, almost all the other pieces that user space does in hypervisor framework. It handles PMU code, it handles PSCI, it handles device assignment if available, it handles nested virtualization, which I don't even have an answer to how hypervisor framework would do it. Um, and it most importantly does the catch-all. So is there anything that, if, if there's any, any functionality, anything that the guest executes that the, uh, the hypervisor doesn't know, then in KVM it almost always gets terminated inside of KVM which means you need to patch the kernel to enlighten you with anything at all, which can be frustrating at times. <clears throat> User space is pretty much only responsible for anything that's device related, MMIO exits, and uh, a bit of device layout and, and memory layout uh, customization. So let's compare the two. Hypervisor framework is very little code, right? Um, it does as little as it can in the kernel, only what it has to from a security point of view, but not from a functionality point of view. Um, it moves all of that flexibility into user space. If you wanted to, you could basically fake a CPU that doesn't exist. You could create something that basically reports itself as an A57 inside user space. It wouldn't actually execute the instructions like an A57, but you could expose it as that because you give uh, user space all the flexibility that it actually can do using the hardware capabilities. Uh, but it doesn't handle a lot of um, the more sophisticated virtualization features, such as VPMUs. Like you cannot uh, use real counters, real hardware counters um, using that framework. You cannot use uh, the hardware accelerated interrupt controller, uh, which means your uh, interrupt injection path is always going to be slower since it goes to user space. Uh, there's no nested vert right now. I don't know if they have plans on implementing it there, but it's not there. Um, I also haven't seen anything at all related to device assignment. Like, how would you even do that? How would you take an interrupt? How would you take, like, just share, share pages there? Maybe they will find a better solution or a good, good solution there um, to, to make device assignment work as well. But today, it's just not there. Whereas KVM has all that support. KVM actually has support for almost everything you can think of in, in the KVM land, uh, in, in the virtualization land on, on these systems, uh, x86 as well as ARM. Uh, it has fast paths for interrupts, for exits. It can, for example, have I.O. event FDs where you go and, um, and, and have a fast path in the kernel that uh, realizes, hey, I have an, um, a poke here to um, a register that really just should be a file descriptor write into vhost. So you have a lot of um, very advanced features that allow you to fast path things. Uh, but at the end of the day, um, because you keep all of that logic in KVM, you remove a lot of flexibility from user space. So if you wanted to abuse virtualization for completely different purposes than what KVM envisions, you just don't get to do it. So KVM is different from hypervisor framework in its philosophy, but these things look super much similar, don't they? It's available on x86 as well as AS64. Uh, it's supported in QMU, by the way. Um, it has support for interrupt virtualization, like the VGIC thing that I mentioned, on x86, but not on ARM yet. So I don't know if they are working on something. I'm, I'm, I don't work for Apple. Uh, but they did eventually, after about eight or something years of hypervisor framework life, they eventually also came, across, uh, came around to implement interrupt virtualization for hypervisor framework on x86 that is hardware accelerated. Maybe they will do the same thing for ARM. Uh, on, in QMU, everything is upstream and just works as of last year already, so uh, if you just take a recent version of QMU and, and, and use dash axle HVF and dash CPU host, that one's important, uh, it literally just works. Uh, most of your QMU command lines will just, will just run. 
So what what is what is interesting, or what 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 am I what I'm curious about um, as as to to brainstorm and maybe have some uh, inject some sparks into into uh, some brains here, is could we use that concept somewhere else? Like the the idea is super powerful. Like have a super minimal interface that doesn't try to to boil the ocean. KVM tries to boil the ocean every time, right? But do you actually need to boil the ocean for every use case? So Apple was able to build a fully viable virtualization environment with literally like a shared page and four syscalls. Could we do the exact same thing with nesting, for example? Could we build a nesting interface that looks like hypervisor framework? Should we start maybe on macOS, build a, hypervisor, a genuine hypervisor framework nesting interface, and then just say, hey, if you want to nest, you don't get super fancy, fast interrupt virtualization, but do you actually care, right? And uh, the second thing is uh, KVM in its evolution over time has um, started off from a super big monolithic, monolithic uh, uh, environment where we uh, try to handle everything in the kernel um, away slowly to a model where we're moving more and more into user space as well. So if you, if you look at the progression uh, on between architectures only, if you look from x86 via ARM to RISC-V, for example, um, we are already naturally moving into the hypervisor framework direction. So RISC-V is, is almost the culmination of that, where um, the, all the register setting interface and getting interfaces are literally hardware encodings for those registers. Um, we have, I think, about five or so octals only there. It's, it's much, much, much more simplistic um, than our traditional old, old school x86 interfaces, which was doing different structs that need to move things around, and then if the architecture changes, the whole uh, thing just falls apart. Um, should we move more into that direction? <clears throat> should we rethink uh, maybe even the KVM interfaces on x86? And ARM as well. So on, X, on, on x86, for example, what happened recently is that we had um, uh, MSR support. We, we added support that MSRs can be deflected into user space. User space can just say, hey, this MSR over here, I want to handle it, please. Just leave it alone. Uh, should we do more of these things? Should we just basically at least give user space the ability to, um, to be as flexible as it can be? <clears throat> With that, who wants to see it? Ooh, awesome. Uh, I have a super tiny QMU command line over here. <laughs> Simplest thing you can write, basically, um, which is uh, really just a, a small VM that uh, runs Windows. Because well, it's, um, well, show, showing Linux is something I usually do, but this is, this is more fun. Um, it just works. It's uh, sensibly performant. I, actually, actually, I was actually surprised by how well it does perform. Uh, in, in comparison to, or especially, especially if you think about the whole fact that the interrupt controller is all in user space, like even all your APIs go via user space, everything is in user space, right? And it still is a well-working solution. Uh, it's an old image of Windows, so don't worry. It's, it even has outdated like, uh, signatures now. But it, it just works. It, it literally is, is a VM that, that boots and, and is functional. Linux obviously works as well. It's not, uh, that's, that's the easy case. Uh, Mac OS works as well, by the way. You can virtualize Mac OS using this. Cool. Uh, t -t 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 -t. With that, more questions? Yes. How does the hypervisor framework handle uh, debuggability for the guests as using hardware debug registers? How does hypervisor framework uh, handle debuggability for the guest? Um, there's a special set of, uh, of, of callbacks. Um, I think I had them somewhere there. No, there. Uh, 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 there. That one. Um, you see these uh, debug functions there? Set drop debug, exception, right access, and so on. Um, a mixture of these and actual just syswag uh, settings. Have you got practice for that yet? We, no, that one's not implemented yet. I, I had, I had uh, a private branch where I tried to at least make single stepping work, and that kind of worked. But I, uh, upstream doesn't have, doesn't do uh, debug support for the GDB stuff yet. So the, the, in in GDB stuff, if you set a breakpoint on hypervisor framework, on hypervisor framework VM, it uh, won't trap. 
Alex says um, that it doesn't have to be GDB stuff that does it. Uh, there is a callback into, uh, into the Excel framework to set a hardware breakpoint because that is part of the Excel framework and we just don't implement it. But feel free to, like you probably have a Mac somewhere in your... In your... <laughs> too bad, too bad. I should probably change that. Cool, uh, more questions? Volunteers to create a nesting uh, interface using Wait, wait, wait a second for some. I think we do need a microphone for this. Um, it's, it's, getting, it's, it's going to get longer than uh, I can remember. Uh, I, I would otherwise have, uh, you're not audible on the on the stream. No, it's, it's just it's the stream. It's not it's not this room. It's that the stream wouldn't hear you. And so, uh, just just speak in the mic and it's easier. Thank you. Uh, so for the um, combination of work with QMU, if you want to have one Cortex A uh, running uh, theoretically at 3.5 gigahertz, another one at 2 gigahertz, another one with SVE, another one without SVE uh, things, that should be uh, allowable for uh, simulation and SOC with multiple chips. And KVM should be able to second well QMU in its intent to simulate that platform. So in that case, going to don't do everything, but do what you're told by the uh, user framework is, uh, is, is much better. So I, I was trying to, 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 to give you a, a real context for, for why uh, KVM may have good reasons to evolve to... Uh, yeah, I mean, there's also, there's also always different ways to solve that problem, right? You could also just tell KVM to then expose something very different and cache those values on the kernel. But in, in, in general, I feel like um, we are over-indexing KVM on uh, removing that, that tiny last mile between kernel and user space, which is not a super slow switch, um, in comparison to terminate or removing the, the actual exit that really is the, 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 the thing that kills our performance uh, instead. Yeah. Uh, do, do you want the mic or is it short? So first a comment, uh, because Sergio is here, and another thing that runs on hypervisor framework is Keran VM. And for those of us who use Macs and need to do Linux builds or stuff like that, it's a really cool tool because it boots in 100 milliseconds or something like that, lets you run your Linux commands in a context that, is, uh, that persists from one run to the next. So that's really in my opinion, life-changing compared to running a VM. And then a question, um, so what about advanced devices? I have a VM that uh, runs 3D graphics and audio, but one thing I noticed is that I crash the host regularly when I use audio. Uh, so are there other glitches like this that you're aware of? The, um, so anything that's, that's to do with uh, 3D acceleration, audio, yada, yada, all of this is um, orthogonal type of a framework because at the end of the day, you're just creating a device model that allows you to do some either PV or non-PV uh, acceleration of these, these operations. Um, I, I'm not aware of, of audio crashes. Um, I mean, if there's a bug report, happy to take a look at it. Uh, but in, in general, QMU uh, is able to do a lot of these things if you have a Linux guest and a host that is supported for 3D accelerations, for example. But you probably just want to like look three, two seats right of you and, and ask Garrett if we actually do have support for 3D acceleration in QMU as the backend, because I don't know. It, it does work. Okay, it does work. Yes. Cool. Okay. So there's, there's some extra patches needed to, to make 3D work. Okay, cool. Yeah, absolutely. And there's also different different ways and variants on how this whole thing works on, on 3D acceleration, but 
um, yeah, with Linux guests, uh, we definitely have everything we need um, to, to make it happen. MacOS guests are slightly more difficult because they have a proprietary interface. Uh, more questions? Yeah. What about overhead? Overhead. Uh, what about overhead? There's tons of additional uh, switches to user space. Um, these chips are so insanely fast on switching from kernel to user space, it just doesn't matter. Like, as I said earlier, um, we traditionally have indexed quite heavily on optimizing for the kernel user space switch. I have slides from like 10 years ago where I was already showing that um, that is only about 10 to 20% of the performance loss you would have on a VM exit. So what you want to optimize for is to not exit. You don't want to optimize for the super tiny last path of going from the kernel to user space. That's negligible. If you, if you have to move to the kernel already, you, you already lost basically on if, if you have some hot path that keeps poking the kernel space. You're not saying that we're not using the hardware accelerated um, interrupt controller? Uh, correct, for interrupts, that is a slow path. I, I'm, I was surprised by the performance you get out of this already. Were you able to do a comparison with KVM on your MacBook? Is it already running on this book? Uh, can you do a comparison between the two? Yes, you could. Um, if you want to, we can sit down later on, uh, install Asahi, and do an apples to apples comparison. There, there is a, a native Linux port of these systems now. Uh, and so we could literally just go and run a couple of benchmarks and just do an apples to apples comparison. My guess is you would probably see like a 30% or something slowdown at least um, in something that's interrupt or IPI heavy. But uh, for the majority of simplistic use cases, um, like, hey, I just want to have a maybe even single CPU Linux VM to just compile a couple of things here, uh, that's not your case. There, there it's probably going to be in a single digit. Okay, question is, is there, is there an equivalent to VFIO on, on MacOS? Uh, yes and no. Uh, there's, there's this out of the scope, but I'm happy to, to answer that really quick. Uh, there is a, um, there's nothing that actually is VFIO-ish. So you cannot just go and, and uh, tell the, the kernel, hey, give me access to this device, please. What you can do now, um, uh, since two years ago or something, uh, is write device drivers for PCI, including Thunderbolt uh, devices in user space which are in a super tiny constrained environment. So it's not just a user space application. It's really just a tiny uh, environment that doesn't even have access to normal syscalls, but that can answer um, uh, IPC calls, Mac IPC calls and share memory with another entity. So you could write a user space application that talks to a tiny driver that then basically shares the bar regions again, and there you can build your own VFIO driver using that. Do we have the mic still? Thank you. Uh, more, more than five words is not something I can easily repeat. No problem. <laughs> Thank you. I've taken a little bit of a look at um, the universal memory architecture, and I was curious, um, what's your take on, I've heard that it would be better if it was SBBR compliant for virtualization purposes, although I'm not entirely sure that that's important. Uh, and then I guess the only other thing I was curious about was, uh, do you think it would all be possible to do something uh, like a mediated pass-through for a, like a GPU, like the M1 GPU? I'm not sure I actually, I'm, I'm able to extract the actual question out of the question. Well, I mean, the question is that uh, VFIO pass-through uh, obviously involves, uh, I think it's, uh, uh, it's, at least in the context of the VFIO mediated device, uh, it requires if I've understood correctly, something to do with SBBR, although I'm not an expert on ARM architectures. Uh, no, no, SBBR is just a spec that defines a couple of hardware primitives that you have to have. Okay, thanks. That's, I'll that's, do some more reading. Oh, no, no, a bit of uh, firmware primitives that you need to have, but that's, that's SBBR is, is really just about booting. That, that's that's um, orthogonal. So if, if you, what use case are you trying to fulfill? Are you trying to 
I was thinking about trying to uh, share the GPU between the host and a guest okay. with uh, like an unmodified guest driver. Okay, Un unmodified guest driver is, is out of the question in general. Um, uh, what you can do is PV, um, and PV has two different mechanisms. Basically, you have, you have two different paths that are um, easily available. Uh, one is using our own PV mechanism that we have, um, which is what, what uh, I mentioned earlier. Uh, the other one is the proprietary Apple one, which you could reverse engineer, and then just use parameterized graphics interface uh, to uh, access uh, basically a, a PV metal interface in, in the gas. Okay. Uh, I have some more questions, but maybe we can take it offline yeah, afterwards. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, cool. Cheers. Well then, thanks a lot, uh, and happy lunch. <laughs>